and I completely, he stops talking. And I know he stops talking just because there's not sound anymore. And I was like, oh. And I asked him a question he had just answered. So it was clear to all the millions of people listening to NPR that I was not listening. Um, it happens to everybody is what I'm trying to say. But I, what I have found is that if I go into every single conversation saying, I'm not going to leave this conversation until I learn something, mm. will not. Like that's my goal is to learn something from that other person. Then it changes the tenor of the conversation completely for me anyway. And it helps me stay focused on really listening to them. Have you ever heard the phrase becoming the best version of yourself? Yeah, me too. But what does that even mean? And how do we become that person? I'm here to help you navigate through those questions and come up with actionable steps in order for you to live your best life. We've got to discover what we want. We've got to figure out a plan on how to get there, and then we have to go. We can't just sit and wait any longer. Life won't wait on us. So come join me on this constant journey to become the best version of yourself and to find your best you. I'll see you on the other side. All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Nick Carrier's Best You Podcast. I'm so excited for today's interview because I have a master conversator with me today, um, Celeste Headley. And Celeste is an award-winning journalist, author, speaker, musician, um, and you were the presenter of the TED Talk, uh, The 10 Ways to Have a Better Conversation, which is now has over 19 million views worldwide, which is unbelievable. I'm sure that just still blows your mind uh, every single day. But I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to spend with me here today. It's my pleasure. Looking forward to it. Yeah. Well, so I want to get right into basically the formation of the TED Talk first. I, I heard that you were prompted that figure out a problem that's going on in the world and figure out a, and figure out the way to fix it and kind of present that present it in that way. And so I know you talked about how you're a little bit frustrated how people weren't having as many conversations as maybe they should be. But I really was there ever like an aha moment when it was like, this is what I'm going to speak about. I don't know if there was an, an aha moment. I mean, for me, the aha moment came a couple years early. I mean, I'm a journalist, so I see really bad conversational skills <laughs> from our politicians on a daily basis. Um, but I think uh, a couple years before I did the TED Talk, I had a conversation, and I, and I talk about this in the book, that was really important. The stakes were quite high, and um, I should have nailed it. I am a professional con conversationalist. I literally get paid to do that, um, and it went badly. And I started. I really. It really made me stop in my tracks because if I had prepared for that and taken every bit of advice that I could get, the best advice I could get on how to make that go well, and I did this better than most people anyway, and I couldn't make that go well, then there had to be something else going on. And that's sort of what set me on to starting to do the research on my own, kind of starting from scratch and throw out all the research I'd heard before. So what would you have told old Celeste Headley in that what what piece of advice would you have given her that would have made that situation or that interview not go badly? Oh, there's so much. I mean, for example, one of the things that I did and a lot of people do is practice what you're going to say um, when what I really should have been doing is figuring out what questions I needed to ask. Uh, so both so of us – what's the difference there? Uh, what are you saying? What's uh, the difference so there? for example, um, I went in there prepared to give my case. Right. Um, that doesn't generally work. And there's a few reasons for that. Neurologically, homo sapiens are not the best listeners. We struggle to listen. We also are the only species that suffers from confirmation bias, which is when someone you believe something, someone proves to you that it's wrong and it makes you believe it harder. Um, so we have all these things working against us or at the person I was speaking to had all these things working against us where he wasn't going to hear what I was saying. And I needed to work around that. So there's a few neurological tricks you could use. For example, people are much more open-minded if you start off by allowing them to feel proud 
Um, so if you start a conversation by asking them about what's the, what's the the best thing that's happened to them or the best thing they've done in the past week or the past month, um, as ma- you make sure you start with a handshake, just that simple human touch, actually uh, double digits of impact on making a negotiation or a deal go better. So these, there's certain things you can do. And, and for the most part, it's about setting the other person up for success, right? All of these things I'm telling you are about me taking into consideration where that person is coming from. And what I did was I tried to set myself up for success alone and that didn't work. So what are, what are some other ways that you can set people up for success before a conversation outside of just praising them right at the beginning? Um, one of the things is that you have to make every conversation interactive. Like you have to let the other person respond. You know, we watch Sesame Street and uh, we think that that's how kids learn, right? When they say, what color is this? And the kids say green. And we think, oh, that's how children do it. They have to interact constantly. No, no, no. That's how human beings learn. You have to give people a chance to respond and interact, which means you have to keep your little sen- – your your part of the talking needs to ke- be kept to like 30 to 60 seconds at a time before you stop and let them answer and you really listen to what they're saying. Um, people need to be heard. They need to feel that they're heard. And um, that's when a, f- a conversation can actually mm-hmm. become productive. Otherwise, it's just two people saying what they think in the same room at the same time. And there's there's no change that will happen. Wow, that's so funny because I'm actually taking a, a stand-up improv class right now, like something that's completely out of my comfort zone. But that's what I feel like or that's what I've been told and instructed as like one of the things that I don't do very well is I'm constantly trying to think of the next thing I'm trying to say. And then my instructor keeps saying like, wait, give it a second, actually hear what they're saying so you can respond to them and don't just give your own your own piece of advice or be your, your own your own uh, take on the situation. Yeah. You're- and, you know, improv is a perfect way to practice that, you know, because there's this great office. Do you have ever watched the office? There's this great oh, yeah. episode <laughs> where, um, uh, Michael is, is taking improv classes, right? And oh, yeah. every <laughs> single time he does an improv, he ends up holding a gun. Right. right. So they'll be like, oh, here we are at the beach enjoying this sunny day. And he'll like whisper in their ear and the guy will be like, he says he's holding a gun. Right. So he's literally not giving the other person a chance to have their input and he's not being changed by their input. And so he's ruining the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this all goes kind of touches on the fact that when somebody's talking to us, a lot of time we're just formulating our response and we almost miss like the whole second half of whatever they say or the end of what they say. So how do we take a step back and focus on actually being present on what they're saying and not formulating the thoughts in your response beforehand. So first I want to say, we don't just miss the end of what they're saying. We miss most of it. Most people come up with their response within five to 10 seconds, and then they hear nothing else of what's said. Um, it's Stephen Covey always said, you know, we're always listening, uh, with the intent to respond, not with the intent to understand. So, it's going to happen to you. The thing that you can't do is say, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that anymore. You, there's no such thing as clearing your mind. That is BS. Um, you can't clear your mind. Your mind is constantly providing you with context and information and data and statistics and memories to try to help you understand all the inputs that are coming in, the sounds, the smells, what the other person is saying. And the problem is we get distracted by what's going on in our head and we follow that and we, we grab onto it and we just hold onto it and we hear nothing of what they've said because that'll distract us from our thoughts. <laughs> we, we have the wrong distraction here. Your thought is the distraction, not what they're saying. So what you basically have to do is train your mind to let those thoughts come in and let them go out. Um, frankly, I, I don't know of any other way to do that other than mindfulness meditation, which is literally mind training. Um, but that's it's in essence what you are doing. You are allowing these thoughts to bubble up in your mind and not focusing on them and returning to what it is that the other person's saying. Hmm. I don't know. The first thing that came to my head when you were when you were saying that is that maybe you can channel your energy of your thoughts towards always what's presently being said. And I don't like I don't even know if that makes sense, but just like always focusing on channeling whatever energy is going on in here towards like the next word that they're saying instead of letting the energy up here be based on what has been said in the past. 
Yeah, and you're, you've just described mindfulness meditation, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> when you're meditating, you're challenging your, channeling your energy and just paying attention to your breath and letting all this stuff go past. Now, you use that exact same practice to focus your energy on what the other person is saying and let all this other stuff go past. It's the exact same practice. You don't have to call it meditation if you don't want to. <laughs> no, <laughs> you, can, I, you, can, you can call it channeling energy. It doesn't matter. It's just that's basically what you're trying to do. And, and the thing of it is, is that it does cost energy. It does take effort. Um, it's not, uh, you know, this is not a kumbaya moment where, you know, everyone's going to love it and it's going to be wonderful and beautiful. It's going to be hard sometimes to do that. And sometimes you will not be able to do it, in which case I strongly encourage you to not waste their time and your time by pretending to listen, but to tell them, I need 30 minutes. Let, let me get back to you. Um, I need 30 minutes. There's 60 minutes. Let's get back to this tomorrow or whatever it may be. Otherwise, you have to understand that it will cost effort. In fact, listening in an engaged way burns a trace amount of glucose. It's not enough to help you lose weight, but it does <laughs> burn actual tangible energy. I bet it does. And I think it's very – what like, the topic that we're talking about right now is very translatable to interviewing but almost like in a little bit different sense because whenever you – I mean you've interviewed hundreds of thousands of people or whatever. Um, but you prepare beforehand and you have kind of a way that – you formulated a way that you think the interview is going to go. And at least you have questions that you're going to ask. So how do you stop from thinking about that next question of – that you're going to ask – and just completely be present because I think it is a little bit different in an interview than just a regular conversation because you have a question that of an idea or an idea of a question that you want to ask. Yeah, I mean, basically, a, a, an interview is a is a formal and excellent conversation, right? Like it should be structured and go beautifully, but at its essence, it's a good conversation. So when I'm setting up to do an interview, yeah, I do all my homework and I basically I create an arc of the conversation, meaning I don't write questions. I'll write the first question and that's it. So I know where I want the interview to begin. I know basically where I want it to end and I have an idea of what the middle will be. But frankly, there's no telling what everything in between is going to be like because I will be changed by whatever it is that they're saying. You know, how many times have you heard an interview where they'll be like, I just heard this yesterday, by the way, where someone will they'll ask a question and say, you know, how did you get started in, in architecture? And they'll say something like, um, well, you know, back when I was young and, uh, you know, my, my uncle was murdered. And so after that, blah, 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 blah. And the interview will come back and go, well, that's interesting. So where did you study? And I'm like, what? Murder? Wait, hold on. Go back. Um, so when you write questions, there's a tendency to do that. You're just going to the next question. It's better to just give yourself bullet points. Like these are sort of the topics I want to make sure I touch on. And don't write the questions. Let the questions come to you. And it, it ends up being a discipline. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's you, you're not going to be able to do that on the first day any more that you can go to the gym once and get a great pump and then you're done for the rest of your life. No, it's going to be a daily discipline of getting better at that and better at that um, to return your focus to them. And what I have found I can do is that if I sort of have my bullet points there, I can at this point focus on what somebody's saying. And my brain is now trained to formulate that next question in the background. Um, it's doing the update <laughs> while I search the internet, right? I mean, so I can do that in the background and then when they finish their sentence, I can take a breath and go, but what about la la? Okay. So it just probably come with, that comes probably with a lot of practice and just doing it so much over and over again. Well, I wanted to get to at least the beginning and the end of the conversation and then that arc in, in the middle of it. Did you, do you like actually tactically create something that shows that arc? Like do you have a piece of paper that says like start, finish, and then like some bullet points up here? Or what does that exactly look like? Or are you just in your head? I started, I did. I would actually I would actually write out the arc, beginning, middle, and end. And then I would have all the, the bullet points there. Um, you know, I actually wrote a, a book literally that has, I wrote everything I know about interviewing and it's on Amazon. Um, it's called Herd Mentality. And it's basically, here's how you do a good interview uh, based on not just me, but like some of the best Steve Inskeep, all the best people from NPR gave me their input on that as well. Um, but you, you do, you start, you meet yourself where you are. So if you're not practiced at creating an arc on the fly, and that's one of the hardest things, it, then you just do it in advance. 
just write it out. Um, write yourself an intro uh, because the intro helps focus your mind. It's like that opening paragraph in the essays you had to do for school. It's like, this is what this is about. Um, and then create your arc. Here's the beginning and the middle and the end. The, no understanding that the middle and the end very likely might change. Um, and so you have to then change that arc in your head. Mm. And if you need the time, especially because you're in a podcast, right? You can edit this. Um, if you need the time, say, hang on with just one second. I'm going to consult my notes and then look at your notes and you can redo it and then you can go back. Yeah, cool. Um, so you said that I've heard you say that one of the number one questions that you get all the time is how you can or how people are like, how can I get other people to talk to me differently? Because people yeah. blame bad conversations on other people. And, and there's so many different instances, right? People blame a bad uh, – when they go on a date and it's like, oh, they're just someone who can't have a good conversation. And probably people in business do that all the time. Like I didn't make the sale because the other person wasn't a good conversator. So how do we start taking ownership and responsibility for the – level of conversations that we have. Yeah. Fewer than one in five people uh, blame themselves when a conversation go bad. Fewer than one in five. Um, and that math, it doesn't really work. <laughs> so we're not great. We're actually good at seeing what other people do well and don't do well. We are incredibly inaccurate at judging what we do well and what we don't. Like the vast majority of people say that they're above average drivers. Which again, <laughs> that's not how math works. Um, so you're from LA. I'm from Atlanta. We know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Atlanta drivers are crazy. They are insane. Coming from an LA native, you guys are nuts. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, you have we have to understand, and I tell people all the time is like when I'm talking about these things that we don't do well in conversation, I'm not talking about you or you or you. I'm talking about us, including myself. Like we are literally going to have to work at this for the rest of your life. It's never going to be something you just master. Um, conversation skills are are a skill. They're not a they're not knowledge. They're not facts you can memorize and then you're done. They're a skill that you have to constantly practice. So in terms of understanding, taking blame for conversations, you can pretty much assume you have 50%, at least 50% responsibility. And I would even take it further because frankly, at this point, because I've improved my conversational skills, I can, not always, but I can single-handedly turn a conversation around, which means I, I have a lot of power in that way. People want to change others. And the, the, the sad news is you just can't. You know, you will come to conversational bullies who interrupt you all the time and there's things you can do, but if they don't want to change, you won't be able to. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just going to have to instead learn how to either not talk to that person if it's possible or deal with it if you have to talk to them. Um, and it's the same thing that's true with every other foible that everyone comes to me and says. They run on and on and on. They won't stop talking about their kid's dance recital. Whatever it is that you hate about the other person, you know, one of the exercises I have people do all the time is I say, write a list of the like five or six things you hate most that people do when you're talking to them. Now, take any identifiers off of it and walk it around to the people who know you best and say, how many of these things do I do? And you will find... What my past experience has taught me is that you will find you you do a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> that takes courage to be able to do that exercise. That's it for does. sure. <laughs> Everybody, everybody's like, yeah, you do every single one of those. <laughs> yeah. Um, the things that annoy us most are the things we do. Yeah. So it sounds like you said that everybody should have the initial – or just the idea that it's basically 50-50. Half my responsibility, half yours to have a good conversation. But you said now that – you feel like you've developed conversationally uh, so much. You probably almost feel like it, you have the, the power, if you will, just to put a number on it, like 75%. Like you feel like you can bring somebody who's maybe not as good of a conversation up to a higher level just because you can have a better conversation or just because you know the different tools too. Yeah, absolutely. And a good interviewer, that's what you're supposed to do. You know, a lot of interviewers make this mistake of thinking that they need to prove in an interview how smart they are. Um, and – People don't actually care how smart you are. Your job is to is to really let the guest shine. Um, ask them the questions only they can answer. Bring out the best in that guest. And after 20 years practice of doing out that, uh, doing that, bringing out the best in another person, I've gotten relatively good at it. I'm not great at it. 
I mean, I'm not perfect. Um, there are plenty of times. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, I came away from a party I had in my house and I was like, oh my God, why did I talk so much? Um, so it is not a perfect, you know, art or science for me, but you can get good at, at bringing out other people's specific knowledge and the things that are so interesting about them, the things they know that nobody else knows. Um, if you can find that thing they know better than anybody else in the world, you're going to have a great conversation. And we even have scientific studies showing that your enjoyment of a conversation increases as the amount you talk goes down. Wow. That's crazy that there's actually science behind that. Um, but I want to touch on, uh, yeah, it's an ongoing process being able to have the, uh, bring the best out of people um, and interviewing and stuff like that. But how do you actually ask those questions that matter the most to people? Like that, you know, I feel like a lot of us get good questions and we know when we're asked a good question to ourselves, and we're like, oh yes, I want to answer this. Like how do we bring out the, ask those really good questions that bring out the specific knowledge that that person has and the question that makes them feel the most powerful, if you will. So I think one of the things to do is to make sure you're always trying to ask questions that haven't been asked before. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is make sure you're actually asking them questions about the thing they know best. I'm constantly surprised by the people who interview authors and ask them about their family life and not about writing or the people who get a musician on their on them and ask them about politics or anything else except what kind of guitar do you play? Why do you play that guitar? Um, and they'll say something, you know, I, I, somebody will say something. Somebody was inter interviewing the Keb Mo yesterday and one of the best living Delta bluesmen lives in Nashville. Um, now, uh, Delta bluesmen alive. Um, and he says something about the Delta blues. And the first question that occurred to me was like, wait, tell me what the Delta blues is. Yeah. What's the difference? He was talking about being in Chicago. I'm like, well, wait, so what exactly is the difference between Chicago blues and Delta blues? Why do you play that guitar that you've had for 45 years? Let them talk about the things they love. Um, ask, you know, I say this all the time. Questions are so powerful and you can use the brain to your advantage. You know, uh, the Harvard study in 2012 showed that talking about yourself uh, activates the same pleasure center in the brain as sex and heroin. It's inherently pleasurable to talk about yourself and the things you know and the things you like. So if you're talking to a guest, let them talk about the things they know and they like and, and let them be questions they know the answer to about something they care about. It's really, it's, it's quite that simple. He want you know, he's sitting there talking about growing up in Compton. I mean, how do you not have a billion questions about growing up in Compton and coming a, becoming a Delta blues man, right? And then what was that conversation like with the other African-Americans in when he's 20 and he's having to explain to his friends who are all listening to NWA why he's listening, you know, to 100 year old blues like those are the questions i i want to ask that he's never been asked before i find myself being able to do that better when i'm doing a podcast interview if i try to take out of my mind that i'm doing a podcast interview and that i'm more having a conversation and this whole thought process made me think about what i was going to say when i blanked out with the biggest tool for me to realizing the faults that i have in interviewing is being able to go back and listen to the times where they're talking about something and then I bring up something completely else and I'm like, what was I do? What am I thinking? Well, I was not listening at all. Um, but I do the best at that when I put myself just trying to learn more about them instead of actually putting myself in a podcast interview. And you can make that a daily practice. Um, you know, in my book, I try to be as honest as possible. And, and one of the things I, I talk about is being on a national show and I'm sitting there interviewing a BBC reporter and I completely – he stops talking and I know he stops talking just because there's not sound anymore. And I was like, oh, and I asked him a question he had just answered. So it was clear to all the millions of people listening to NPR that I was not listening. Um, it happens to everybody is what I'm trying to say. But I, what I have found is that if I go into every single conversation saying, I'm not going to leave this conversation until I learn something. Mm -hmm will not like that's my goal is to learn something from that other person then it changes the tenor of the conversation completely for me anyway and it helps me stay focused on really listening to them yeah no i think that's a powerful 
like actual tool and tactic that, that you can use to just put that into your brain before going into it instead of just like thinking, I don't know, but yeah, I think that's awesome. Um, but we talked, we mentioned it or you mentioned it earlier about how we have confirmation bias when we listen and also when we watch things, we have that confirmation bias, I think. So, and I, I feel like I've experienced the same thing in doing interviews is that I hear things much louder that I agree with or that I enjoy talking to or talking about then I do the things that I maybe don't agree with or that I just like am not as fascinated in. So how do we drop being a biased listener? Um, I mean, I think that the, the, I didn't, I had to learn how to do this, right? Cause a journalist, you're constantly interviewing and talking to people that you don't like and you don't agree with. And, and one of the examples I use in the book is, you know, I'm a mixed race person. My family came, was owned as slaves on a plantation in Georgia, in Milledgeville, you're from Atlanta. <laughs> um, and so during the, the recent, mo- the most recent big discussion over the Confederate flag, I had to interview a lot of people, sons of Georgia, sons of Confederate veterans. Um, and I'm clearly not going to change my mind. I mean, I think that's, everyone can, get that. But you, uh, my point was not for me to change my mind. My point was, you know what, I'm going to go into this conversation. I'm my, my goal is to understand where they're coming from better. That's all I want to do. Let me at least try to understand because everyone is making choices because they think that's the best way to move forward. Everybody. And it doesn't, I'm not talking about serial killers. Everyone immediately goes straight to the extreme. No, I'm talking about regular people. They're all making choices based on what they think is best for themselves and their family. So you can say to yourself, I don't have to agree with this person. I don't have to endorse it, but I can understand what their rationale is. Mm -hmm. Why have they gotten to this particular place? Um, and if you're doing that, if your whole goal is just to understand them from a human level, what were the places along the way, then you start asking questions like, well, wait, what are your sources from that? Where did you come up with that idea? And you can sort of walk them back step by step. You know, interestingly enough, there's this great book called uh, The Knowledge Illusion. Um, and uh, in it, they talk about these experiments in which they're trying to crack confirmation bias, which is really hard. But they found, for example, they would ask a whole bunch of people, what do you think we should do about the situation in the Ukraine? And everyone had an opinion. And then they would show them a map of Europe and they'd say, okay, point to Ukraine. (laughs) And the worse their geography, the worse their geography was. And the average was off by like 1,800 miles. The worse their geography was, the more likely they were to recommend military intervention. So that's nuts. Yeah. So they were trying to figure out how to crack through this. And what they discovered is if they ask people their opinion, like, what do you think about health care? Give me your opinion on what should be done. And then they said, OK, explain us. Walk us through. If we do what you just said, if we privatize all other, whatever it may be, what, what then happens? If people have to explain that, suddenly they begin to doubt themselves because they can't. Healthcare is really freaking complicated. It's merit pay, name it, merit pay for teachers. It even held true when people tried to explain how a toilet works because people think they understand how a toilet works, but there's all that r- reverse osmosis and all that stuff going on. They don't actually know. So that was the first time they were able to document a real crack in confirmation bias. And you can do this in a conversation by simply asking them questions, have them explain their reasoning and their thinking. Wow. I mean, I think it all just comes down to what you said in terms of going into the conversation, just wanting to learn something, not wanting to, not knowing that like maybe you're not going to agree, just learn wherever they're, whatever point of view they're coming from. Um, so, you know, we've talked, you've talked about how becoming a better interviewer, interviewer and a better conversationalist is an ongoing process and you're never going to be at this level where you feel like you've reached mastery. So what do you currently struggle with the most in terms of having a best conversation? Um, for me, I have adult ADD. Um, so my brain it could be in Tanzania by the time you finished your sentence. If, (laughs) (laughs) um, every single word people says, you know, people talk about radiant thinking all the time and radiant thinking is awesome, but they have whole training courses and how to do radiant. Do you know what radiant thinking is? So it's where they'll like give you a prompt, a word, and they'll say, okay, now, now draw lines to like 20 different other blank spaces and then tell us all the words that one reminds you of. Right. So they'll say like log 
And then you're like, okay, that reminds me of forest and camping and blah, blah, blah. Right. And then they keep going out. It's like a radiant. It's like a sun. It ends up looking like this. They're trying to get you to new thoughts and perspectives. Okay. But that's actually how my brain works. (laughs) Like that's literally how an ADD brain works is it just is constantly radiating out. So I struggle constantly, not only to to terrain my brain in, but to not have non sequiturs because uh, someone will say something. Yeah. Someone will say something and I'll, I'll have radiated out (laughs) 16 steps away and I'll say like, Oh yeah, just like Oscar the Grouch. And they'll be like, (laughs) (laughs) you jump from A to Z real quickly there. (laughs) Exactly. I left out all that, that middle stuff. So that, you know, that's hard for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. That's one. that's actually one of the things <laughs> going back to improv. That's one of the things that we do at improv to get your brain going that we do drills on like how to get to A to C as quickly as possible. Because I, I think a lot of other people probably have that, that problem as well. It's not just necessarily just unique to you. Everybody's mind oh, just yeah. wanders so quickly. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And it, and especially in our distraction culture that we have right now, you know, Microsoft is, is uh, has test for years, tested people's attention spans and on the internet, at least, our attention span is about eight seconds long, which is one second shorter than that of a goldfish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we all struggle to stay focused and stay on task. It's not just not just me and other ADD sufferers. So yeah, it, it's something we all have to sort of learn how to relax. Right. So you talk about how important it is for businesses to have or to have better conversations and how it's, I think the number was 37, it cost businesses maybe $37 billion on uh, in money because of bad conversations. Yeah. So okay. when you go in, I know you talk to different businesses and companies and things like that about how to have better conversations. Is there any like number one question that you always get asked from different maybe company managers about how to have their employees have a better conversation? Yeah, it's almost always about email because everyone is under the impression that email is more efficient and more effective than conversation and it's actually not. Um, There's a very limited number of cases in which email is going to save you time and be more productive or efficient and we use email for everything. Um, and so we're wasting a huge amount of time. You know, the number one cause of project failure is miscommunication. The number one cause of miscommunication is overuse of email. So what? So when should we be using email and when should not? Because I don't think it's – at this day and age, it's almost impossible to think that email would ever go away. So what, like, what would be the benefit or what should we use email for and what shouldn't we? So there's four situations, maybe five, in which email is more efficient than the phone call. Um, they are if you have uh, attachments to send, uh, if you have a very, very long – missive or message to send. Um, If you have an agenda or list of any kind, here's what's coming up in the meeting. Here's the tasks that need to be done. Any, any version of that um, uh, is better in email. And the last one would be praise uh, Mm -hmm. because praise actually gets the same bounce, emotional bounce for people as if you did it in person. And it's possible that's because people like to read it again and again and Mm -hmm. to forward it on to other people. Um, Pretty much, I mean, obviously there's an exception to every rule, but almost everything else is better over the phone. And I, this is not, again, this is not me trying to be, uh, you know, huggy, touchy. This is just scientific. Human beings have only had text communication of any kind for a really short period of time. We have evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to be the most efficient communicators through the voice and the ears on the planet. Mm -hmm. There is information that is relayed through the the sound of our voice, which we can't even track. And people know this instinctively. Almost everyone has had the experience of calling their friend and saying, hi, and their friend goes, hi, and you say, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. That's how fast information is relayed through the voice that cannot be replaced through an emoji or any word. I, I asked a, 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 a few scientists, do you think at some point text might replace the voice as a better communication tool? And they said, yeah, maybe in like five to 10,000 years, it's possible. <laughs> your, your voice is just, it is the most sophisticated, efficient communication tool you have. Um, and email can't replace it. Yeah. 
I think a lot of people, I think that's why a lot of people get so tripped up though is because they try to think of the things that different conversations have sparked in them and they try to throw that in a text. So like, for example, if someone gets a text from like a significant other, they start to read so much into the text because they can sense some of those things if they're actually having a conversation with that person. And then they, they, they try to just put it onto the text, but it is probably 99% of the time completely wrong. It's wrong. And the part of the reason it's wrong is because you're reading it in your own voice. Mm. That's how you would read that email, but you're not them. That's how the muse communication comes in. You might use the word angry and it means angry, but the other person uses angry and it means like, ah, I'm so angry. Uh, you know, you're reading it in your voice. If you sent yourself that email, you would understand it completely. You didn't send yourself that email, so you probably don't understand it. Right. So I'm sure that I'm sure that some of these businesses are starting to realize that email is costing them money. Is, are any businesses right now doing anything to actual actually implement policies for their employees in terms of like this is when you should email somebody and this is when you should call somebody? Um. There are some businesses. I, I'll tell you, I, I went and worked with the, the real estate company Redfin. Um, and after I gave this you know, talk on when to use email and when not to, the CEO came back and said, I think you just saved me more than a million dollars. Yes, people are be starting to begin to. But frankly, the, some of the worst offenders are the C-suite. Um, they won't give up their email. And as long as the executives won't give up email – Nothing is going to change in your business. You can't lead through email. That's the bottom line. You can't do it. And so it has to start at the very, very top. Yeah, I mean, I think that's just culture in general. Everything has to start from, from leadership and then trickle down from there. Um, is there a question that you wish more people would ask you? about when you like, when you go speak or anything like that? Is there a question that you wish more people would ask you that they don't? So I want more people to talk about um, the fact that they're not introverts. Um, I really need people to get this message because it's become kind of fashionable lately to think of ourselves as introverts. And I hear everyone going, well, I'm kind of an introvert, blah, 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 blah. And you're probably not. Um, yeah. There's introversion and extroversion are a spectrum, right? At the very extreme ends are introverts and extroverts. They're relatively rare. The vast majority of people are ambiverts. Ambiverts are in the middle of the spectrum. Sometimes they enjoy being among a group of people. Sometimes they need to be quiet sitting on the couch and watching Netflix. They're more adaptable. They're more likely to be able to go to a party when they don't feel like doing it and actually be like, <sighs> okay, and then engage. There are healthier. Um, and that's the majority of the human population. The problem with people thinking of themselves as introverts when they're not is first of all, they're using it as an excuse to avoid social interaction. And it becomes a really bad, vicious cycle. So someone who's not an introvert says, I'm an introvert. And so I'm going to can't, I'm not going to go out to the movies or whatever with my friend. I'm going to stay home and watch Netflix because I really need alone, need to be quiet right now. And as they do that over time and isolate themselves, their social skills will then begin to degrade, which makes them less likely then to engage socially. And the problem is, is that loneliness and social isolation will literally kill you. Loneliness degrades your internal organs. It makes you more likely to suffer from cardiac disease. It shortens your life by more than a decade. Um, it will literally kill you. In fact, it's so dangerous. The UK just created a new minister post of UK, the minister of loneliness. So I, I have to get to people to stop saying, oh, I'm an introvert and then isolating themselves because they're following that along. Number one, you're probably not an introvert. And number two, even if you are an introvert, you have to get out and have social connection. It's just harder for you. So how do you get people to stop saying that they're an introvert? Is it just revealing to them how much is hurting them? I don't know. I wish I had that answer. Do you know that answer? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's not. I don't. I wish I knew that. I mean, the best thing I can do is just tell you it's really bad for you. It will 
kill you. But I can, there's other things I can tell you. For example, they can take they have they have sh- they've given people tests, right? Tests on all kinds of cognitive things, math and history and all these tests. And for some of them they would they would have them have a 5-minute chat or 10-minute chat before they took the test. Those people outperformed the others in double digits. Mm-hmm. Your whether you like a chat or not, your body and brain will respond to social interaction with another person, even a stranger, even if you think you're going to hate it. And we've tested this over and over. Your endorphins go up, your serotonin and oxytocin level goes up, you are a better thinker, you're more creative, you're less stressed, your cortisol level drop. I mean, physiologically, emotionally, neurologically, you will respond nine times out of 10 positively to a social interaction. It's not going to go well. There's two ways in which a conversation has a negative impact. And that's if it's a hostile or two people are offering you advice. (laughs) 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 Um, But every other time your body will respond. Okay. So you talk, you know, your Ted talk is called 10 ways to have a better conversation, but I'm really interested in how can you best really connect with somebody on a deeper level. So how what are the best ways to really connect with somebody because I think a lot of us have the feeling after leaving a good conversation after leaving a really good conversation it was like we just clicked. We just had a good connection. So how do you have a deeper connection with somebody through a conversation? Um, ask a lot of questions. And don't ask deep questions. Like some of the worst things you can do is ask like, you know, if you, you know, didn't have to work ever again, what would your ideal day look like? Come on. That I feel like first date que- I feel like it's a first date question. Yeah, it's those are all so dumb. That's a bad idea. Um because a you're not they're not they're giving you an, a response that they think is going to make them look good. That's not a real response. Ask them about their memories, ask them about things they've done, ask them about um their tattoo, ask them about their hairstyle, ask them about their hairstyle list, ask them about the jewelry they're wearing. I mean, people, especially if you're on a date, people put time and thought into what they put on. So ask them about it. Ask them about the significance. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I always ask people about their tattoos. And I was just, I was, I took a train trip around the entire country in January and I was in New Orleans and I'm sitting at the bar at the flying burrito or something. And the, t- the, the bartender sitting there and he's, and I was like, Hey, is there a is there an interesting story about that tattoo on his, on his left arm? And he goes, no, no, it just, and then he launches into this 20 minute fascinating story about this tattoo. Um, There's always a story, but ask them about, you know, it's interesting. I was at the Ted summit um, a couple years ago and this nuclear physicist comes up, nuclear scientist comes up to me and says, you know, I've watched your Ted talk a bunch of times and I still don't know how to start a conversation. How do you start a conversation? And I said, "Um, well, you know, it looks like you're from, from uh, Japan. Where are you from? And he said, I'm from Kyoto. And I said, I've only ever been to Tokyo. So is Kyoto as, as packed and crowded as, as Tokyo? He goes, no, 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 no. You've seen the pictures, the temples, the cherry trees. I'm like, yeah, but those are like, the tourist spots, like, do you guys live in apartments or actual houses? And he's describing it. And I was like, do you have like yards with dogs or, and he starts describing Kyoto to me. And about 10 minutes later, I said, well, that's how you start a conversation. You ask them questions. They know the answer to about something they care about. And sometimes that will lead to a deeper conversation. And sometimes it won't, Mm -hmm. you can't force the deep conversation, but you can get that person talking about something they care about. Right. And I think a lot of, and I'd, realize this myself i think we make starting a conversation so much more complicated or harder than it needs to be it's like just pick out the obvious thing that is right in front of you and ask them about it exactly that's exactly right ask about their t-shirt ask them about their t their tennis shoes you know whatever it may be they there's a story behind all of it i mean think about all the things you have that you could actually talk about why you have them why you love them i could totally tell you about my hairstylist she's fascinating um and yeah, or, or whatever it may be. Just, yeah, pick out the exact thing. That, and, you know, frankly, if that's the weather, then ask about the weather. Because people always have stories about the weather. How is it different from where they grew up? Some people choose where they want to live based on weather. Mm-hmm. You know, there's always a story there. Yeah. Well, I wasn't going to ask I wasn't gonna ask this question, but it did come up in my head earlier. So your, your, your shirt says, nah. Oh, it says, nah, Rosa Parks, 1955. <laughs> uh, 
That's awesome. Super cool. Yeah. My son has one that says, uh, uh, we out Harriet Tubman, 18 to 60. <laughs> Did you guys get him at the same place? Same place. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, very cool. Uh, well, the next question I want to ask is kind of about your own goals and own vision, if you will. And I always start off by asking the age question. So how old are you currently? 49. 49. Okay, awesome. So 10 years down the road, you're going to be 59. Um, so what does 59-year-old Celeste Headley look like? What has she accomplished? What has she achieved? And what are you currently doing? Um, so I have a lot of uh, goals for the business. I mean, right now I'm a speaker and I lead workshops, um, but I don't essentially make money unless I'm on a plane. Um, so that I'm, I'm starting a whole series of webinars and training programs um, that uh, – I, where I can not only can I do I not have to travel to do them, but it's also a way for me to sort of reach more people um, because there's so many gigs I have to turn down because I just can't be everywhere. So that that's one thing. Um, but can I on this podcast, can I swear? Yes. 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 OK. So uh, I have this belief that um, your happiness increases in inverse ratio to the amount of fucks you give. Um so I still am not completely happy because I kind of care. So I have a feel, but I've found that as each decade comes and goes, I stop, I start giving fewer fucks. So yes. I mean, at, I hope <laughs> that at 59, I'm like that woman who walks into Starbucks in her slippers and is like, I don't care. <laughs> there uh. are other things to worry about. I, I, I hoped, I don't mean not caring about the world. I mean, obviously I'm passionate about what I do. I'm very dedicated to what I do, but the stuff that you really, it doesn't matter that nobody he's going to care about a hundred years from now. You know, I, I was watching a, uh, uh, the Ken Burns documentary and I was looking at all these old pictures from like 200 years ago and, you know, and thinking these posed pictures and the, to me, their hair looks just terrible. And I was thinking, you know, they took all this time getting dressed and getting their hair ready and I don't care about it at all. Like it means less than nothing to anybody later. And those are the kind of things that I want to stop worrying about. Yeah. So are there, I, I think you see a lot of quotes that, or I know I have seen a lot of quotes that it, it comes with age. Um, so, so hopefully it just naturally will for, for most of us, but are there things that you can actually do to start not giving a crap about what other people are talking about? I mean, I think you have to sort of, I mean, I'm, I am a Buddhist, so I meditate a lot. And so I'll meditate on things like gratitude. Um, and I, I, I note down every day in my planner, what are you grateful for? And sometimes it's like coffee, good, strong coffee. You know, we, I have found sometimes with gratitude journals, sometimes they can backfire because people are always looking for some deep meaning of, you know, I'm grateful for the spiritual whatever. Um, but sometimes the gratitude is just like, God, these, this pen I'm writing with, I love it. Um, and so I've tried to I've, – I've started trying to sort of focus on all these smart, small, tiny things that go well in my life every day that I just love. Um and be grateful for them. I, I just bought a house in, in April and I, about a few weeks ago, I sat down in my living room and I looked around my living room and I was like, I love everything in this room. Like everything in this room is not a compromise. I, I have it. I own it because I love it because it's mine and I'm sitting in my place. And when I, when I shift my focus to really spend time to focusing on those things, it just makes me happier. Hmm. Interesting. So I heard you say uh, on a podcast a, a quote that you like, and it was that you can't always be becoming. You have to sometimes just be being. And I'm like a very, I'm always like the proponent of you're always growing or you're dying, that sort of thing. And so, like, that was like the first quote that I thought of when I heard you say that. So, tell me a little bit more about what that means of like, you can't always be becoming, you have to be being. So, this constant growth mindset that we have, um, growing to what purpose? You know, I heard the economist Kate Rayworth say uh, that if you go to the doctor and they say you have a growth, that's never a good thing. <laughs> it, rapacious, constant growth is not is neither natural nor is it good, right? What you want to do is is find um, grow the parts that need to be grown. And the rest of it be stable. Mm -hmm. um, we the human brain is not designed to be 
focused and working all the time. And in fact, constant research has shown that those who work, who are the least productive are those that work the longest hours, literally, because the human brain is designed to pulse. It pulses between focus and rest, focused and rest. Um, right now we're in this mindset and this is literally what my next book is about. We're in this mindset where we don't let our brains go idle. And that's not the way homo sapiens works. Uh, if you're going to actually be the best person, then you need to let yourself relax, let your brain be idle. When was the last time you felt bored Mm -hmm. and yet boredom is an incredibly fecund, fertile time for your brain. That's where in the background, your brain is sort of sifting through all the stuff it's learned over the past few days. That's when it starts to make, that's when it starts doing radiant thinking. That's when it starts to make connections that are unexpected. Mm. That's when you have some of your best new ideas is when you let your brain go idle on the surface. And in the background, your brain never stops working. It's, it's doing stuff. Um, But if you're focused and kind of muscling through it all the time, you're going to short circuit. It's it's not good for you. You need to pulse. And that's what I want to encourage people to do is pulse. Become and then be and become and then be. Well, I think that's so powerful to give people some sanity because I think we're all – because we're such a productivity-driven age right now and to know – and to have the comfort in just being sometimes is the best way to be. And the most productive. And, the, and the, actually the most productive, right? Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, before I ask the last question, I want to acknowledge you, Celeste, because continually today you've gone back to, I'm not an expert, I'm not great at it, I'm still working. And I think that people who are able to have the courage to acknowledge the different things that, the different gaps they have in their own ability and the different things that they're not as great on is so, it takes so much courage. And like we talked about earlier, if you can name some of the things that are your pet peeves that people do in conversation and you can go and ask other people, what do I do or which of these do I do? Like that takes a lot of courage. I feel like you have so much of that um, and you have displayed so much of that throughout your career. So I just want to make sure I acknowledge you for that because I think it's so powerful for me because sometimes I, I feel like I hide in some of my weaknesses. <laughs> yes, don't we all? I mean, we all <laughs> right. do. Yeah, we want to think, we want to tell a good story about ourselves. That's understandable. That's okay. Um, and, and of course you do. You're the person that knows your best. But tell your best story about yourself. But also, you know, we're all a work in progress. <laughs> well, well, this has been an awesome interview and so, many, so much great information. I know people are going to want to learn more and support you more. So where can people find more about your upcoming book uh, and everything like that? Obviously, you got the TED Talk on YouTube. Um, we Need to Talk is the book that you wrote 2017, maybe? Came out yeah. 2017? Okay. okay, 2017. Awesome. So where can people more uh, support you and everything like that? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way is just to go to the website. That's where um, our, my team has worked hard to gather everything together. It's got links to the books and the, it has links to all the videos uh, as well. That's the easiest thing to do. Awesome. And when can people expect the new book to be out? It has a release date in April of 2020 coming from Penguin Random House. And the title of it is Do Nothing, Break Away from Overworking, Overdoing, and Underliving. Mm. Well, the last question I like to ask is we've talked about how becoming the best Uh, conversationalist and being the best interviewer is a constant journey. And so that's kind of what I feel like becoming the best version of yourself is it's a constant journey. I don't know if we're ever at the best version of ourselves, but hopefully on our last day, we can take our last breath, having the confidence that we got as close as we could. Um, And I always feel like it's also feel like it's a unique journey. Like I think the way that I'm going to become the best version of myself is going to be different than the way that you become the best version of yourself. So what I want to ask for you personally is if you could currently do or work on three things to get you closer to the best version of yourself. What are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Uh, I would be more patient. Uh, that is what I, I'm not great at being patient. Um, I would also uh, take more time off. I mean, there's a reason <laughs> I've written this book is because I'm the worst. Um, <laughs> my son would tell you I don't know how to relax. I'm learning how to relax. Um, and the final thing is, is I'd be a better piano player. Yeah. Oh, wow. I want to improve my piano skills. <laughs> That's awesome. 
That's so cool. Well, so hopefully you can improve your piano skills with the time that you're taking off. That's oh, there. You go. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All ties yes. in together. Well, I really, really, I really appreciate you coming on today, Celeste. That was awesome. My pleasure. Thanks so much. Good questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks.